Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me again as we continue uh, this study through Genesis in the beginning. As we just look through the, the text, the narratives, the stories we have in the first book of the Bible uh, that really set the foundation for the rest of Scripture. And so I hope you are engaging uh, with this study. I hope you are learning something and just seeing that what the authors are trying to communicate to us. And most importantly, why these stories are just so important as foundational pieces to our faith that is going to continue today with the study of Abraham. Um, was that we've actually crossed the halfway point. This is session four. Uh, and so we have three left after this. And so here is the reading schedule if you need it. Uh, you will be reading kind of up through the life of Jacob this week. I said it last week and I'll, re I'll repeat it again here. Please keep up with this as much as you can. As we get into like these bigger character studies, I can't go through everything verse by verse. And so the more you can familiarize yourself with these just narratives and stories and certain parts of them, I think the more helpful these sessions are going to be for you in explaining uh, kind of what is going on. Uh, so it will be your benefit uh, as if you can keep up with this as much as possible. So let's go ahead and just jump right into today, session four, Abraham, the one that I am probably most excited for. We're going to be covering Genesis 11 through 23, looking at really these two questions of why is Abraham important and what do we relate to um, about Abraham. The first one, why is Abraham so important? If you think about other world religions, uh, namely Judaism and Islam, and Christianity. Uh, those are known as the Abrahamic religions, uh, that they are from Abraham. So if three of the five major world religions come from one person, there's something we need to know. Um, and I hope by the end of this, <laughs> you know what that something is, and you see why Abraham is so important and critical uh, to the Christian faith. The second part about what do you relate to, you might not have an answer to this question, and that is perfectly okay. If you are not super familiar with some of these passages, I think we lose sight of this question, um, that Abraham is, is absolutely a giant hero of faith, but he's also human. There are mistakes, he has doubt, but there are certainly parts of this story that we can find ourselves in. Maybe not situationally, but certain, uh, um, certainly emotionally. And so normally I have three different slides, I think, for like what we're gonna do uh, in each session, some questions, and then what I need you, like kind of knowledge before we get going. Uh, the, I've combined them all into one. The only thing I really want you to think about as we go into this is that the New Testament is written based off of the Old Testament. The New Testament authors didn't have the New Testament. It, it sounds like common sense, but for some reason, uh, it was just incredible re revelation to me that so much of the New, well, all of the New Testament is written with the Old Testament in mind. Uh, Luke, who is, we named the uh, author of the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, is the only identifiable non-Jewish author in the New Testament. Therefore, they are Jewish, so they understand the Old Testament scriptures and have the story of Jesus. So there's really something to be said about the fusion of these two, of, of God writing his one cohesive story of redemption all throughout scripture. I hope by the end of today, you kind of start to see where some of these parallels are. And especially if you read the New Testament, how rooted it is in Old Testament reference um, and language. But I'm so excited for this. Uh, let's jump right into Genesis chapter 11, uh, the Tower of Babel. And so what we see right out the get-go is that there's one language um, and people coming from the East. So the first part here, right, this is like what we get post-flood. Um, and so kind of humanity has been fruitful and multiplied. There's a lot more people in the world um, and on earth, I think is what we're supposed to assume here, and that there is one language. 
everybody speaks the same language. I think that is a very hard concept for us to grasp in the 21st century just because of just ethnic and cultural diversity and how many different languages there are in the world. Uh, but at one point in time, everybody spoke one language. I think that we are supposed to get this picture of just unity that is restored from the flood. To take this one step further, we get people migrating from the east. Um, normally from the east means that you are moving into God's presence um, as heading to the east is being cast away. Uh, this, So I think after the first two verses, like we're not in a bad spot yet. The problem will be when we move into God's presence to then take over God's throne. And well, that's kind of what is going to happen. Uh, in verse 4, the, the people who came from the east uh, say, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Uh, if you had the chance to watch the Cain and Abel uh, kind of bonus video I threw out there. Cain goes and builds a city, uh, and we get this first idea of like what can happen when cities are built. I um, mean, the sinful just nature that can come from that many broken, sinful humans being together in one population. There's kind of many different parts in this sentence. Um, the first is there was this like ancient idea that gods made cities not men which i think is kind of this idea that that it was the gods who would raise up and take a land area and cultivate creation in that land area uh, and so men were not to build really cities was not the thought but what happened was these cities that would have obviously the potential to be just kind of hubs of great sin we're going to see that we've already we've already seen it uh, from Cain, and that's kind of what happened, why the flood came. But it really just begs this question, uh, if man built the city, then who would be God? The answer as we go through this whole story is that they were trying to be God, that they are still trying to become like God. Part of that is the Nephilim that we talked about before the flood were still present after the flood, and so there is still, I think, part of this idea and assumption that there's there's this mixture of divine and, and humanity of man still wanting to become more like God. So they are now taking over the role of God. The second part about building a tower that reaches to the heavens, the like very literal Hebrew translation um, is something along the lines of, let us build a tower that is in the head of the heavens. Whatever they're doing, wherever they're going, is to build this tower that literally reaches where God is or takes over where God is. Like We're trying to get to heaven without going through God so we can be God. The last part, well, there's two, two parts here. The, the second to last part, they want to make a name for themselves. If we think about what God's mission is, which is to redeem creation back to himself, and make his name great amongst the nations. If we're in this because we're supposed to make God's name great, but it's this direct contrast of, I'm going to take the role of God to do the duty of God. I'm going to go dwell where God dwells. And it's going to be my name that is made great. I mean, nothing more says I want to be God. Uh, and the last part that, I think we can kind of get tri tripped up on is this lest we're dispersed over the face of the earth. They don't want to really be scattered. Now there's a difference I think in this idea of dispersion versus traveling. I mean we understand this as humans. We pick where we go on vacation. right? We travel where we want to travel where with dispersion you're being scattered. Like you're not taught you just have to go and find somewhere to live. Uh, this comes down to the control and sovereignty part of God. They want to choose where they go rather than some outside force, God, telling them where to go. Uh, so this is the human heart, if we're being completely honest. Uh, that this whole story is, is about the human heart 
uh, and wanting to get to heaven to be like God and pride comes before the fall um, and eventually there will be judgment on the human heart uh, just like we actually looked at with the fall of Satan uh, who reached heaven as an angel um, and desired to be like God I'm um, exactly like God pretty interesting here we it's the Tower of Babel uh, Babel is kind of the Hebrew pronunciation it's the city referring to Babylon what we're talking about here in this creation of this city is Babylon uh, which will become a great uh, military force um, and cause a lot of problems throughout scripture it's a, it's a very very sinful city uh, in scripture kind of it literally is the biblical example of rebellion to God uh, we see that and that's actually how what it is birthed out of the last part of this is that uh, God kind of confuses all of their languages. This is where I think we get the creation of culture, the creation of other languages, and that has obviously grown into what diversity we have in the 21st century. But to confuse, the verb is Bilal, um, and so it's actually God Bilal the people at Bavel. Um, and if you think about why people, like when people babble, it's normally because they don't know what they're saying. They're confused. They don't know their next thought. That is actually exactly what happens at the Tower of Babel. Um, and so I just, I think this is fascinating. The language and authorship and the word choices, uh, just so magnificent. So that is um, Genesis chapter 11 for the most part. So let's go ahead and jump into Genesis 12, dealing with the call of Abram. Another very simple but yet extremely crazy thing to think about that I never really thought about was that what we're well, Genesis 12 comes after Genesis 11. So the sinful nature of humanity is what will lead into God calling Abraham in a way. That there is always a godly response of him making the first step to go redeem his people, and that's going to come through Abraham. I'm, I'm going to read the first three verses here because they're just so vitally important of chapter 12. I'm going to say, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, um, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is known as the Abrahamic covenant. It's actually this set of uh, verses that we get right here. Right? In very, very short, it's kind of like, go be a blessing and I will be bless those who bless you. It's all about going, blessing, and receiving blessing. Is kind of what this is boiled down to there's i think three things that abraham is to get out of this based on this uh, god will make him a great nation land he will make his name great descendants the family will be great um and the i will bless those who bless you i think is like this universal blessing um that who abraham blesses and who returns that or whoever blesses abraham and receives abraham will inherently be blessed both parties here uh, will receive blessing and when i talked earlier about the the fusion of the old testament and new testament the more i read the gospels the more i see that jesus did not just say words <laughs> uh, most of what jesus said was rooted somewhere in old testament scripture i think outside of some of the parables that we get but most of what jesus says comes like in reference to some sort of old testament scripture and so one thing that really, really studying this passage of Genesis 12, I think this is kind of like the original Great Commission in a way, that when Jesus tells the disciples right, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth and therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, just teaching them to obey and follow the commands of God and that he is with them until the end of the age, I don't think Jesus just kind of pulled that out of out of a hat and said it. I think because Jesus knew the scriptures and knew God so well and knew the story that was being written 
throughout all of human history, it kind of has this same part of go and be a blessing to those, right? And I will bless you and I will be with you. So these two things, I I believe go hand in hand. I see the parallels and it has opened up just how I kind of read the words of Jesus in a new light. Um, so go ahead and like, just, just ponder that for a moment of comparing the Great Commission uh, that in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 28, versus what God is calling Abraham to here um, in Genesis 12. So Abram responds, and what we get is actually, I think, vitally important if we're going to respond to this great commission, whether it's God calling Abram or what Jesus calls us uh, as his disciples to, that Abram went as the Lord had told him. He took Lot, his nephew. Uh, he takes Sarah and all of their possessions, all of their cattle. Abram took everything. He took what God had given him. He took his resources to go out and set on this journey with God. Uh, he will need kind of each piece of this will become such an important part of the story. Um, and I think it's just, it's interesting to study just how Abraham responds to a lot of what God is calling him to. And the first step is he's not going to restrict anything from being a part of what God is calling him to do. Uh, what we get is they get to the land of Canaan. Uh, Abram passes through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Moreh. Uh, this is going to be a new theme, especially that we track through Abraham uh, and actually the rest of scripture is like trees. We talked about it uh, back in Genesis 2 um, and 3 with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, they are signs of God's presence and provision. Um, and so this is pretty pretty interesting. We're going to keep kind of going through this. Of They're almost like checkpoints for Abram to be with God um, and to receive what God has for him. Um, and so we get that at the Oak of Moreh. Moreh means teacher in Hebrew. And so I think it's just, it's a lot of symbolization is like, what is God going to do? Uh, because God is going to certainly teach Abraham so much about who Abram is and who God is himself. We, we talk about the promised land a lot in church and Christianity um, and the Israelites and kind of how did that ever come to be? Uh, your answer is in verse 7. Uh, when they got to the land of Canaan um, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. The land had already been promised, um, but here we get, I think, the specific enunciation of that. This is fascinating to me. Um, I love this. Abram moves to the hill country on the east uh, of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west um, and Ai on the east. So he, he pitches a tent. He's kind of hunkering down to stay a while. In between Bethel um, and Ai, Bethel literally translates to house of God. Uh, AI translates to the ruins or a heap of ruins in a way. Uh, I see these two things just so much as like the house of God and the house of the world in a way of like holiness of God and sinfulness of humanity. And what is so fascinating is Abraham has been called to go to these people to make the nations great, to bless the nations, but he still has to stay connected to God. And what happens is he ends up right in the middle of both. And this is a very important lesson that, that I think we could take and learn and have to figure out what this looks like in our own life. Of We need to find a way to position ourselves between the house of God and between the world. If I think as Christians, if we just stayed inside the church, we wouldn't reach anybody. We wouldn't get to the nations. But if we were so consumed in the world, we would never come back to the house of God. We would be disconnected from the God calling us to the nations. Uh, and we're actually going to see the problems of this with Lot. 
um, Abraham's nephew. I don't think I had you read these stories, uh, 13, 14, and then chapter 19 on Lot. I'm going to cover them briefly just so you kind of know what's there. And it helps really tell this whole story. Lot ends up settling in Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah are like the sinful of the sinful list cities, if that's even a word, but I think you get the picture uh, in the Bible. So what was the heap of ruins is where Lot's kind of bunkering down. To just tell you the story in as few details, <laughs> kind of in summarization as possible, uh, Abram settles at the Oak of Mamre, another tree, a uh, blessing. And here God tells him, I will make your offspring uh, as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. His descendants are going to be as numerous as the dust of the earth. That's a fantastic prayer um, and promise that we get from God to hold on to. And what happens next? Uh, is that Lot is actually taken in a war. Uh, someone escapes, a Hebrew escapes, comes to find um, Abram, who was the Hebrew, uh, living by the Oaks of Mamre. Abraham basically gets an army, goes and rescues his nephew, Lot. What we get next is Abram is blessed by Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. Um, in Hebrew, Melech means king. Zedek means righteousness. So Melchizedek uh, is the king of righteousness. And he blesses Abraham. This means Abraham or Abram is doing something right. Uh, if the king of righteousness is blessing you and we're doing good. This is to set up like the exemplary heroic faith from Abraham. This is perfect. Abram is doing great. Things are all good, but he becomes human. And this is, I think, where we really start to see the human nature of Abram. Uh, Genesis 15, there's two moments of doubt. He's got, like, all of the promises. Like, this is mad. God is saying, I got you. Right? You go bless the nations, right? And I will bless you beyond your wildest dreams. He actually tells him in, in the first verse of, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram responds and goes, basically like, you promised me all these descendants, but I don't have a kid. Fair point. <laughs> uh, like to continue the family line, to have descendants, you, you need to have at least one child. And so God tells him to look up into the heavens to see the stars. And basically that is how numerous the offspring would be. Which this is, I think, where we can really learn to just trust what God says because he's God. Uh, in a way of Abram's told like he's got the, the promise of the great nation, the great land, the blessings that will come. God tells him his descendants will be like dust on the earth. God, Abraham, fair question of well, how am I going to have this many descendants if I don't have any offspring? Um, and God says, just look at the stars. That's how numerous it's going to be. And what we're told is it just says, and he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. Like Abraham just believes. I think there's like always good reason for Abraham not to believe. Like things don't look like they make sense. It doesn't look like it's going to go how God says, but Abraham just believes and stays the course. That he trusts what God says because God's word is enough for him to just have the faith. Like if anybody can make his offsprings this descendants, it is the very God saying it. And what we know is that God will be faithful to his word. And he, Abraham believes after doubting. It's counted as righteous. But there's more doubt. How many times have we received a promise from God? We begin to doubt. God gives us the reassurance that we need. We believe again, only to doubt again. This is where we just come, I think, to 
just resonate with Abraham or Abram at the, I still at this point of the story. All right, and so in verse 7, God says, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur uh, of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess, right? The land of Canaan, the promised land. But he says, oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Like, how am I supposed to know when to kind of like take over and that I'm supposed to take this land? Uh, God tells Abraham to bring him a goat, a heifer, a ram, a turtle dove, a pigeon. Abraham brings all of them. There's some sacrifices that happen. Um, and what comes, Abraham, like the sun's coming down, Abraham goes to sleep. Uh, and what <laughs> God speaks to Abraham through a dream, essentially, uh, and tells him, your offspring will be wanderers and they'll serve the land and they'll be afflicted for 400 years. How you're going to know to take the land is your people are going to have no home and they're basically going to be slaves. Like, good promise. This is, I think, where where we might just pack our bags and go back home. All right, when things start to get tough, when it's not a promise that might work out in our favor. <laughs> There's some added reassurance uh, for Abraham in verses 15 and 16. Right. As for you, uh, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. Nice, but what we're really getting at here is that Abraham's not going to see the promised land. Like everything that the land part that God has promised to Abraham, all of the descendants, Abraham's not going to see the fruit. He's not going to see actually the results of what God is promising him. I think at that very moment, if we don't see the results, we're packing and going home. We're going back to climb the staircase to heaven to be God in their own lives. All right, but Abraham stays the course. Right, because what happens at the end of this chapter is on that day, right, the Lord cut a covenant with Abram saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, uh, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, uh, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Like, we've got, we've got a covenant now, right? That the Lord cut a covenant with Abram saying, to your offspring, I will give the land of these geographical borders. Uh very important things to kind of note here is like, why doesn't Abraham receive anything? Actually, the only thing Abraham receives in the promised land will be a burial site for Sarah, which we get um, later, actually, at the end of Genesis 23, I think. To cut a covenant, uh, basically, there would need to be a sacrifice. Blood would need to be shed to ratify a covenant. And since we know that basically this covenant will come true later, like all parts of the covenant will be fulfilled at a later date post Abraham, that the blood actually to be shed to ratify and fulfill the covenant is going to be Abraham, that he will die before this comes into fruition. Uh, and Which is kind of what we're also getting told to your offspring. I give uh, this land part of, to really understand this, um, is Hebrew grammar in a way, if I could ever give you a plug as to why to learn Hebrew, it's to understand certain parts like this. Just the way that authors write things a lot of times in, in Hebrew is they are like outside to see the completeness of a situation. So the, the death of Abraham is seen as complete to ratify and cut the covenant and then what God is saying is if God is outside of time, then what he says about the future is he is seeing as a complete event, even if it's later in our eyes. Right? God outside of time sees the fruition and culmination of the Israelites and God's people taking over this land. If you look geographically, we're not there yet. We're still 
living in this, which I think is a pr actually pretty fascinating to think about. Of uh, If you look at the, the geographical borders of this land and where Israel currently stands today, all of that land has not been occupied. So God sees it as a future event and we're actually still living in it. But the author has also seen the death of Abraham as a final event before this. Um, so the blood to be shed to ratify a covenant would eventually be Abraham. And like I said, if, if that was it, of God's promising you all of this and it's actually going to require you to die and you'll never see the fruit of it, how faithful will you be? It's very easy to doubt, to go home and call it quits, right? But what we see is when Abraham keeps going, like we're here in faith because Abraham kept going. Because it was actually just not about Abraham. It was about the faithfulness to God and the furthering of faith that Abraham keeps going and that we sit here and I can actually just record this video to tell you about Abraham. It's fascinating. And we have to just understand the level and the depth of faith that it took. But there's humanness, there's brokenness, and that's what we get with Genesis 16. Uh, Sarai, Sarah, and Hagar, the servant. Um, what we're told is that, that Sarai was barren. She could not have children. But she had a servant, Hagar, who she eventually tells Abraham, like, take my servant or slave, it's the same word, and just obtain a child through her. Uh, these midwives, these servants were, <laughs> in all honesty, not treated very well. And so I think we kind of see that of just like Sarah throwing her maidservant at her husband, like just have a child. Like there, there, there is a level of maltreatment and abuse that comes just to maidservants, to slaves, um, all throughout just the Hebrew Bible. And what happens uh, is this is exactly what happens as Hagar conceives um, and she looks on to Sarai with contempt. Uh, another way to kind of translate this is like insignificance, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. Of when Eve, Eve was the mother of all the living, meaning like her primary role was going to be to multiply, to bear children, um, because that is something only women can do. And so if Sarai can't bear children, what is her purpose? And that is how Hagar looks upon Sarai is like she's now insignificant. And I have Genesis 3 there because if we look at the, the condemnation and the consequences on Eve, part of it is this pain in childbearing. And I talked about it then, and I'll bring it back up because I think it's going to make more sense now, is God was not talking solely about the pain of delivering a child. It was the environment in which children are going to be born. This child, who will, will be named Ishmael, we'll get to that, was born in contempt. Right? It was born out of a barren wife. Like These are painful situations that children are being born in but we're told that's how it's going to be, right? That was the consequence of sin. It breaks all of these relationships. And what happens is Sarah actually deals so harshly with Hagar, Hagar flees, he runs away. And we're told that the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. Uh, tells her to return and submit to her mistress. She'll have a child and bear Ishmael. Um, why is the child named Ishmael? Ishmael means God listens. She's out there like fleeing from Sarah and just God listens. There is incredible encouragement, I hope, for you as much as I get in just knowing that God hears us. That when, even when we're being treated harshly, we feel like we got to run away. God still sees us and there is still blessing that can come, which is Ishmael. Uh, and just this idea of like running away from like our embarrassment or our difficult situations. 
really only to be found at a spring of water in the wilderness. Uh, it brings me to just my mind of John 4, uh, the woman at the well. The details of the story are different, uh, but it was the woman going in the middle of the day because she was trying to avoid embarrassment in the city. Jesus meets her at a spring of water or a well and offers her new life that is everlasting and living water through him. It's in this moment that the angel that appears by the spring of water to Ish or to Hagar in a m moment of just incredible like pain to offer her new life that is coming through a child that is Ishmael the similarities are just so I think close and it uh, just reminds me of this story so much uh, even to the point of Jesus tells the woman to go back into the city she came from just as the angel is telling uh, Hagar to go back to Sarai. So that actually ends up happening. She returns um, back home knowing that God is a God of seeing and listening. Which brings us to uh, Genesis 17, which is just these promises and the, what covenant is going to be made. Uh, Abram was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to him and says, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. If you have ever um, heard El Shaddai and did not know what it meant, it means God Almighty, which is just something we can really lean into about the power and the sovereignty of God. And so what he says is, walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and make you multiply greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. I think this is a little bit of a warning rather than like this great celebration. I mean, cause look like walk before me and be blameless so we can make a covenant. Like we have to walk before God and be blameless. Those are two things that I, that we really struggle with. And Abram falls on his face. And a lot of times when we see eight people falling on their face before God, it's not out of like wonderful celebrate it's a lot of times out of pain fear like this is a, a warning and we're gonna see kind of what's happening through this as to like this is severity of faith like we've got to lean into this as like this is serious and what god's calling us to is we've got to pay attention abram verse five name change to abraham Name changes, new identities really, really mean something um, in scripture as if like walk before me and be blameless so we can make a covenant uh, wasn't severity enough to pay attention to what's coming next. Let's change the name of Abraham. Hopefully we've got your attention. Uh, Abram meant exalted father, which I think is in the Abrahamic religions, right? It is Abram that is exalted. Everything he is doing is to exalt God. From this moment on, this covenant that is going to be established changes Abraham's name or Abram to Abraham, make him a father of multitude. Once again, the promise of all of these descendants. Verse 7, um, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring uh, after you and throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. This is like forever. This is good news. This we can we can celebrate that the covenant of God is everlasting. He is faithful forever. And it's these first three words when he explains the terms of what the covenant will cover, what he is committing himself to, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God's promise to us is that he will be God. We can find great faith, hope, and trust in that. That is encouraging to me. That when God covenantally promises himself to us, Abraham and his descendants, which we are, it's for God to be God. He will be exactly who he is to us. If we would just only be who he created us to be back. Um, but I just find such great hope in that God will be God. The covenant established is the covenant uh, of circumcision. 
And this is why I don't think this is a wonderful celebration because if we think about how this would go down, um, the process of circumcision would result in a lot of blood, weeping, and pain from a child. Like, blood, weeping, and pain is the sign of the covenant. I'm not jumping for joy thinking about those things, which I think is why this is a, a covenant of like, it's going to cost you something. There's going to be pain in following God. But what's the promise on the other side, or actually the promise that sets this whole thing in motion, is that God will be God. He has promised to be God even in the pain, the weeping, the blood of a child. Because it is the blood that it will ratify the covenant. We get that just illustration with the covenant of circumcision. And that is what is going to set apart the Israelites from the nations around them. Chapter 17 ends with the promising um, of the coming of Isaac. So Abraham uh, and Sarah will have a child in their old age. They're like 100 at this point. Uh, God will, you would call him Isaac, right? And God's going to establish his covenant with Isaac, the second born child. Um, this will start the process of the inversion of the firstborn. Uh, in the ancient Near Eastern culture, the first child, the firstborn, uh, was the one who would receive double inheritance there to be married first, like. They are the ones to take over the role of the father. The father kind of establishes, in a way, his promise and covenant with the firstborn uh, to then take his role and lead the family. God's in the business of changing things up. Uh, so we're going to see this just incredible inversion of this. It started with Cain and Abel, of Cain being the firstborn, but Abel is kind of the one that receives the blessing in a way. We're seeing it here as God's going to establish his covenant through Isaac and not Ishmael. This will continue on as we get through Jacob and Joseph. It's not the firstborn that normally ends up uh, with the promise. And so just that is the beginning part um, of this. So let's go ahead um, and move on to Genesis chapter 18. We're back at the Oaks of Mamre. Um, and now there are three men standing in front of Abraham. Uh, they ask, hey, where is Sarah? Uh, basically to deliver this message to her of, hey, in a year from now, you're going to have a child. Remember, she's 100. Sarah laughs. Um, and God, God says, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? These are dagger questions that I hope convict you in the same way that it, it really stirs some thought in my head of is anything too hard for the Lord? We disqualify ourselves because we're like, we're inadequate. We're way past our, our prime, but it's in these moments of like the greatest miracle that God can give them, which is a child. God's going to continue his promise day by day, even in the most unlikely circumstances. Hold on to the fact that Sarah laughed. It will make a lot more sense. Um, in a little bit, but just this question of, is anything too hard for the Lord? I unfortunately answer this question, yes, a lot. Um, but it's really something to think about because remember, God has promised himself to be God. But what this conversation is about, it kind of takes a shift as they look down towards Sodom. I hope you recall that Lot is in Sodom. Uh, one thing that, that blows my mind and really challenges me in scripture is how leaders pray for their followers or how they pray for the lost. We pray for people, but oftentimes we pray for them to God to directly go to them, leaving ourselves out of it. Like we're just a middle like a third kind of part of the triangle that's like way over here like we'll pray but like we want god to go just take care of that 
Like, hear our prayers and leave us out of it. Specifically, Abraham and Moses, like, just how often they intercede for the people, like, the lost. Moses intercedes for the Israelites, like, many a times before God's about to just destroy them in, in a lot of different ways. This it, this blows my mind of, like, what would happen if we actually just interceded and went to war for people in the presence of God? Rather than just, like, offering prayers from the sidelines, like, what if we got down and just interceded on behalf of the lost people around us? Like, what would happen? We get a picture of it here. But how do we intercede? Abraham shows us, right? It tells us that... Um, I'll give me one moment to find here. Here we go. It's in verse 22. Abraham stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near. We intercede for the people by standing before God and drawing near to him. And then there's this beautiful part of like, like remember, this is the pending destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham goes, suppose there are 50 righteous people within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Basically, God ends up saying, if I find Sodom in Sodom, 50 righteous people, I'll spare the whole place. What about 45? What about 40? What about 20? What about 10 righteous people? Each time God says, yes, 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 yes. There won't be 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. There's not 10 righteous people in our own generation in this world. There is only in the course of human history been one righteous person, and God has spared all of eternity because of that one righteous person who is Jesus. If God can find righteousness in one person, he will spare the earth and creation and humanity of its looming destruction. That one person being Jesus who intercedes literally on our behalf because of his righteousness. This picture that we get knowing what we know post-resurrection in the 21st century is so encouraging to my faith. And I just love the authorship of the Bible and just the New Testament understands this and it writes based on this. I hope you're seeing that. I hope you're able to connect these dots. Because Abraham intercedes. Why? Because he's still positioned between right the ruins and the house of God. Unlike Lot, part two of Lot. Here we go. We're told that the angels, which were the kind of men with, or with uh, headed down towards Sodom that were with Abraham, Lot was sitting at the in the gate of Sodom. How Abraham stood between uh, the house of God and AI. He was still connected to both. He was connected to the world, but he was not fully in the world. He was still connected to God. Lot just placed himself smack dab in Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and the angels that are there refuse to spend the night. They go into Lot's house. Uh, Sodom was no, and Sodom and Gomorrah known for their sexual perversion. And so they're like chasing after these men, the angels, um, coming looking for who enter is, is entering Lot's house. They ask for the men to basically come out so they can know the men to have sexual relations with the angels, essentially. Uh, and Lot actually just offers his daughters. He says, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. This is like, this is sin. This is the broken heart and deceitful and just evil hearts of humanity. Like this is, it's brutal to read at times, but it shows just all of this, just what, what the righteousness of, of Christ means for us and what the righteousness of Abraham at times just means for Lot specifically. Knowing that, the angels basically see that there's not right 10 righteous people here. Um, and so they will be destroyed. 
but they tell they, they try and rescue lot um they rescue him they're like listen go tell your family like we're up and out of here this it's going to be destroyed uh we're told that the sons-in-law who would be who were to marry lot's daughters they were not officially married yet they thought he was joking like they did not believe a word that he said, but Lot gets his two wives or his wife and his two daughters. Sorry. All right, and take them out of the city. Like go, and what we get is just so fascinating. But he lingered. It was so hard for Lot to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. The more we are in the world, the harder it's going to be for us to leave the world. Before we get infiltrated by all of this by everything that Sodom and Gomorrah represented, if we pitch our tent in the middle of the city, in the middle of sin, we're going to be infiltrated by it and we're going to linger in it. But the, the angels come and they're like, escape for your life. This is the call. If you are lingering in sin, escape for your life because of what you know is next and because of what God has done for you. Right, we get the details that God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah uh, with a fire or rain of sulfur and fire from the heavens. Lot's wife looks back and becomes a pillar of salt. If we think about the sin that we've left behind, everything we've lost by being rescued by God, we're going to be stuck. And I've always wondered why everything that Lot, all the decisions, why is he saved? Like, why is he protected? I think it's because of Abraham's intercession. And it is the intercession of Jesus that saves us. God remembers Abraham and protects Lot. God remembers the righteousness of Jesus and protects us. Um, and just as... Lot was going to use his daughters. His daughters use him. They make him drink wine. They both lie with him on two different nights. They become pregnant, continue their family. I want to take you back to what God says to Cain um, in Genesis chapter 4, that sin is always crouching at your door. This is something we just absolutely need to remember. Because if we hang around and linger around sin enough, it's going to come inside and it's going to take us over and it's going to cost us our life. So if you are lingering, escape for your life. Genesis 20, we get the story of Abraham and his sister. At least that's what he tells Sarah to say. Uh, this is paralleled with Genesis chapter 12. Both of these, um, I just now referenced it because the stories are so parallel in the same thing. Uh, Genesis 12, they're going to Egypt. Genesis 20, they're going to Negev. Uh, both times that Abraham is fearful of if they find out Sarah is his wife, they will kill Abraham to take Sarah as their wife. So he goes, well, just tell him you're my sister. Uh, this is like this just human nature and, and sin of Abraham, uh, kind of in all honesty. He is human, but he still has faith and God still just restores him time and time again that um, we can just have such great faith in that. Genesis 12, Sarah is taken into Pharaoh's house is what we are told. Uh, in Genesis chapter 20, God comes to Abimelech before anything happens is what we're told. The result is they're both destroyed. Or not destroyed. Uh, there are consequences. Genesis 12, Pharaoh's afflicted with great plagues. Genesis 20, the Lord closes all the wombs in the house of Abimelech. They become barren. What do I need you to know? What are we supposed to learn from this? What do I need to know? Neither Pharaoh or Abimelech made a, quote, wrong decision. They thought it was his sister based on what they were told, um, but they still suffer the consequences because our sin does not just affect ourselves. It always has a consequence for other people. Genesis 21, we're coming back to Sarah, Hagar, and Isaac. Isaac is born. I told you to hold on to the fact that Sarah laughed. Um, that is because Yitzhak, Isaac, uh, means laughter. And so it, it's the, the names... And meanings of names are just so important. They're actually just so clever um, in a way. It, it really adds just details to the story. 
When Isaac is born, Sarah demands that Hagar and Ishmael be cast out, away, get out of here, see you later. Um, and that's what happens. So Abraham gives him some bread and a skin of water, sends him into the desert. Not going to last him very long. Uh, like I said, these servants are often treated very poorly and not well. Uh, and so Hagar, Hagar, literally means the immigrant. She was an Egyptian slave servant. Uh, and because of this, how she is treated, the pending 400 years of suffering, a lot of this and, and the way that it goes down in the book of Exodus, a lot of people will point to this moment of Abraham and Sarah, how they treated Hagar is the beginning piece for Israelite slavery in Egypt, that it is the mistreatment of the immigrants. It will be the Israelite people going to Egypt that are taken into slavery kind of almost as a flipped result of uh, the Israelites, Abraham and Sarah, uh, mistreating Hagar. Pretty fascinating uh, stuff to think about and just the full story that's being told here. Uh, but Hagar is in so much distress, uh, she ends up putting Ishmael under a bush to let him basically let him die. She backs away and and says, let me not look onto the death of my child. What's interesting is God hears the voice of the boy. Interestingly enough. Sees the broken, sees the helpless. Um, the angel of God calls to Hagar. Basically says, you're protected. Like, I see you. You'll be okay. Hagar opens her eyes. Sees a well of water. Sees everything that she needs because God continues to see her to listen and provide everything she needs, even in the wilderness, even after being cast out. No matter the harsh situations she is put under, he provides. And Ishmael, there is promise to him too. He lives in the wilderness. He becomes an expert with the bow. He's a great hunter. Um, all of this happens in Beersheba. There is this treaty with Abimelech to, because they took over this well, but it was really rights to Abraham's descendants. Um, the place is called Beersheba. Abraham plants a tree in Beersheba because trees are God's presence and provision, which is exactly what happened here um, with Ishmael. Genesis 22, this is this part of the story I think we're all probably more familiar with, uh, which is the sacrifice of Isaac. God tested Abraham. Right, the trees, the blessings, the sun is going to become the test. So he tells him to take your only son, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah, offer him as a burnt offering on top of one of the mountains. This is what happens. All right, they saddle up a donkey, they go. Uh, there's a group of them. And Abraham eventually, they stop, says to the young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. This is the first time we get the word worship in scripture and it has to deal with sacrifice. That's what worship is. Worship is surrender. It is sacrificing ourselves in our current moments to God. As they're walking, Isaac asks, where is the lamb? Uh, for a burnt offering. Good point. Abraham just... <laughs> In such heroic faith, goes God will provide for himself the lamb. Like the level of faith in this moment is just so amazing. It's all about surrender. It's all about sacrifice because, yes, God is calling him to sacrifice his one and only son at this point. Ishmael has been sent away. Everything that God has promised to Abraham hinders upon Isaac. But it's about obedience rather than receiving the fulfillment of promises. Abraham goes as far to even tie up Isaac and grab the knife. We miss this point, I think, a lot. It's like there's the faith of God will provide, God will provide, God will provide. Until we get at the top of the mountain, it's like, uh, it's time to go through with this. It's time to go all in, to jump two feet in. That's what Abraham does. And faith ties up Isaac, grabs the knife, is ready to 
do everything that God told him to do, God provides a ram in the thicket. God provides the ram for himself. They sacrifice the lamb, the ram. And Abraham names the mountain, right? The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. This is great. There's a lot to learn from this. But here is everything that you need to know about Jesus. It is pretty parallel to this idea. Right, Abraham, they rode to the mountain on a donkey. Matthew 21, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey. The two details we get, take your son, your only son whom you love, to Moriah and sacrifice him. Isaac eventually asks, where is the lamb? God will provide for himself the lamb. Based on what we know, uh, 2 Chronicles tells us that Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem and the temple was built on the land of Moriah. Matthew 27, Golgotha is a hill in Jerusalem. It is the hill that Jesus was crucified on. Given these two deals and, uh, details and a lot of archaeological study and evidence, most scholars believe that Jesus was crucified near or at the summit of Mount Moriah. Where God called Abraham to surrender is where God sacrificed himself for us. John 3.16, write this, The language of take your son, your only son, whom you love, to sacrifice him is way too similar to this of God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. It is where God calls us to surrender that he's already covered us with the sacrifice because he's provided the lamb for himself. It is himself. He is and became the sacrificial lamb. He provided the substitute ram in the thickets, thorns and brush and stuff like that. Matthew 27, Jesus was given a crown of thorns. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. It was on the cross, it was on the hill, it was on the mountain of Golgotha that Jesus was provided for you, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life because God has promised himself to us to be God. He's El Shaddai. That is what we praise him for. I thank you for joining me in this study. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you as we just continue to get to know God better as he reveals himself to us through the words of his scripture. God bless you all, um, and I hope to see you next week.